Okay, we're going to talk about how to write formulas for simple ionic compounds, and it's actually not quite as difficult as it, as it might seem. All right, formation of ionic compounds. Uh, the main way that you can tell, as a matter of fact, the way that you can tell an ionic compound from a, a molecular compound, a covalent compound, is that you always have a metal and a nonmetal. For example, uh, sodium and fluorine. Sodium right there, and then fluorine right there. Uh, and that is, that's pretty much the, the acid test for, uh, for that. Uh, pretty easy to tell the difference. So um, looking at the formation of ionic compounds, it ends up being a little bit more complicated, but not very much. You see here with sodium, you've only got one extra electron that you need to get rid of in order to form a stable noble gas configuration of neon. Over here with fluorine, you need to gain an electron to get a stable noble gas configuration. In this case, by coincidence, it's neon also. It doesn't have to be neon for both. It doesn't have to be the same uh, noble gas. But anyway, let's see what happens. We lose an electron from sodium. It goes over here to fluorine. And you notice that we, we lost the electron there. It's formed the stable noble gas config, uh, configuration over here also. Now, uh, neon is usually written is electron configuration more like that. So that's what we'll do. Um, also, since we've lost an electron and we've got a got an extra proton, we formed uh, charges, uh, one charge here. We've got a, also a negative charge over here because of that extra electron. So those are attracted. They're gonna move closer together. And let's go ahead and take these charges away, just showing that this is a nice neutral compound and everything's happy and wonderful. The only thing we have to do is come back and just emphasize that that electron belongs to what is now fluoride now. So uh, that just makes a nicer picture. Anyway, we're going to talk about how ionic compounds form just a little bit more on a larger scale. And then we're going to be ready to look at uh, some problems with it. Okay, so this is sodium chloride, a representation of so sodium chloride like you put on your french fries. And this is one of many uh, ionic compounds. Now, uh, surprisingly enough, probably to most people, ionic compounds are not made of molecules. There's no such thing as the sodium chloride molecules. And instead, they're called formula, formula units for a variety of reasons, for a number of different reasons. Uh, first, most obviously, they have ionic bonds rather than covalent bonds. But it goes further than that. They don't, end, uh, they don't exist individually. You can have individual molecules. Uh, you don't typically have uh, individual formula units. They form larger structures, which we're going to see. Um, they're the lowest whole number ratio of ions in an ionic compound. That's what we use when we're writing a formula for an ionic compound. We're writing that formula unit. And speaking of which, when we do that, the name of the metal always comes first. Um, the names of the metals we can get off the periodic table. A lot of times the names of the nonmetals we can get off the periodic table, but there's also times where there's ion names we just have to memorize, some of the polyatomic ions. All right. And so uh, they align together to form crystals at all size scales, which you're going to see in just a minute, uh, from the scale of the atom, just a few atoms across to the scale of things that you can see with the unaided eye. So, for example, our sodium chloride here, again, it this formula unit doesn't exist by itself. It forms structures with its brothers and sisters that look something like that, which is pretty amazing. Uh, this thing is only just, you know, like seven or eight atoms across, seven or eight atoms tall, but it still has a structure to it like this. And that structure remains on up to the size that you would see, you know, be able to see without a microscope or anything. Now, I didn't want, to, also, I didn't want to give the impression that, uh, uh, all crystal, anything crystalline is formed from an ionic compound. That's not the case, but ionic compounds do more readily form these uh, regular uh, crystalline structures. All right, so we're actually ready to look at doing our first uh, problem with this. A uh, type of question you might get on a test would be something like, what is the formula for calcium fluoride? Well, I've got just a few steps here, three steps, uh, only two of which you use very much. Uh, the first is figure out the charge for both ions. Well, calcium is right there. And then fluorine is right over here. And um, calcium is going to try to become like argon. And when it does, the calcium loses two electrons to be like argon. It develops a plus two charge. Over here, the, uh, 
fluorine is going to become fluoride. It's going to become like neon. And uh, it's going to develop a negative one charge. So just sort of a summary here. Uh, calcium plus two and fluoride is minus one. Uh, the next step, and a lot of times this is the last step, uh, crisscross the numbers. Now what that means is just write both of these out here uh, with the charge and then do, do what is called the crisscross method. That goes there, that number goes there, and that number goes there, and you end up with, that's the correct answer, CEF2. Uh, now, a couple of little caveats. Uh, one is that the plus and minus don't apply when you're talking about atoms. When you pro bring these down, there's no such thing as a plus or a minus number of atoms, so you don't have to worry about that. Also, if it's just a, a, a one charge, you, you just uh, ignore it, essentially. You don't say, for example, H2O1, you just say H2Os. Okay, and the last step, which is needed infrequently enough that sometimes people forget to do it, is that to uh, reduce the numbers to the lowest ratio if needed. And in this case, we, we don't need to. The calcium is one and the, the fluorine is two, so we don't really have to worry about that time. But there are times when you do, so you need to make sure, you know, check on that. All right. So uh, another type of problem, a good example of what you might get on a test, uh, what is the formula for sodium sulfide? And again, the first step is to figure out the charge for both ions. Uh, sodium is right there. Sulfur, which will become sulfide, is right there. And sodium is going to want to try to be like uh, neon, stable noble gas configuration. When it does that, it loses one electron and develops a plus one charge. Uh, for sulfur, we're going to try to be like argon. We're going to gain two electrons and develop a, a minus two charge. So that's sort of the summary right there. And then the next step, and usually the last step, usually, is to crisscross the numbers. And again, what that means is to just write down each one of these with their charges. And uh, that one goes there, that one goes there. So we end up with Na2S, which if you examine it, and see that the it is in fact the uh, lowest ratio that it can be, then that is actually the answer. Now the only other thing that sometimes people have questions about is the use of parentheses. Sometimes people get very stressed about parentheses, and I'm going to show uh, really quickly before we even tackle any of these with a periodic table. It's actually very simple. The rule of thumb is that you only use them when you need them, uh, when there's more than one atom involved. And so the example here is a perfect example. It's kind of a scary looking formula, but it's a perfect example. We're not going to go through all the crisscross and everything. I'm just going to show you what the, what the formula is. Uh, that's calcium phosphite. And you can see pretty easily that you don't really need the parenthesis here with the calcium. There's nobody, nobody is going to confuse that that three belongs to anything other than that calcium. So you can see an example of one where you don't need it. Uh, but you do need it for the phosphite because you've got more than one atom. Uh, you know, make absolutely sure that it's understood that that 2 refers to the phosphorus 2. Also, you don't want to make it look like that there's 32 oxygens. So that's just a sort of quick and dirty tutorial on the use of parentheses. So let's see if we can put that to use. Another question really quick. What is the formula for strontium nitrate? Uh, again, we figure out the charge for both ions. Strontium is right there. We're going to lose electrons until we get to have a stable level gas configuration like Krypton. Uh, so it loses two electrons to be like Krypton and develops a plus two charge. And here's the point where someone might try to look over here at the nitrogen for the nitrate, but the, remember that the nonmetals over here only form ions and end in ide, I-D-E. This is nitrate. This is one of the ones that we have to have memorized. Um, so uh, we you know, we just uh, we're going to assume we have that in our back pocket. Nitrate is NO3 with a negative charge, and then we can go ahead and crisscross the numbers. That number goes there. That number goes there, and we've got strontium nitrate, um, and to, with the appropriate use of the parentheses. Now I do have a little appendix in the back of this video. If anybody needs to refer to uh, any of these polyatomic ions. I don't have all of them, but I have most of the most common ones. Uh, the lastly, again, if if needed, reduce the numbers to the lowest ratio, and we're already at the lowest ratio, so we're we're good to go on that. Okay, one final example, really good example, uh, using something that you've probably not seen before. This is what is the formula for copper two sulfate, and what that Roman numeral is is basically telling you the charge 
of copper. They're, you know how to calculate the charges of the metals over here, the nine metals over here, but there are a few, like in the transition metals, a few of those where you pretty much, you pretty much have to be told what the charge is. Copper can either be plus one or plus two. In this case, it's plus two, and this is how they tell you uh, that it's plus two. So when you figure out the charge for both ions, you know where copper is, but you really can't tell what the charge is from where it sits. Anyway, the Roman numeral is what tells you what the charge is. And then, of course, it's sulfate. Sulfate's not on the table. It doesn't end in IDE. But provided that you remember the formula for sulfate, which hopefully you will, or you're going to be in trouble on this one. Uh, sulfate is SO4 with negative 2 charge. Copper is plus 2. So we're on to the step where we do the crisscross. Uh, we come over here. We put the charges up. Uh, this number goes there, that number goes there, and we end up with Cu2, SO42. And hopefully it is immediately recognized that that is, in fact, is not the lowest ratio. So this copper and sulfate will bind in a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, that's just how it's naturally found. So we uh, reduce it down and then we have our answer. And uh, one other parenthetical thing I wanted to add is over the years of teaching this and talking about ions and forming crystals and things like that, I occasionally get a question about uh, people having heard that, you know, crystals can be used for healing. I've got quartz here. Quartz isn't even an ionic compound, but hey, it makes a nice picture. Anyway, um, asking whether or not the, anything about the po positive effects on healing is, is true. And I wanted to spend just a minute to show that there is actually one example of this, believe it or not. And I'm going to spend just a little bit here. So uh, the one way that I know of to heal your body with crystals is choose the nicest crystal you can find. Sell it to a gullible person who thinks pretty rocks will impact their health in any way. Use the money to take a cab to the doctor. Because the doctor actually uses you know, science. Anyway, we're summarizing now. Uh, Non-metal atoms joined together by covalent bonds are called molecules. Metal atoms joined to non-metal atoms by ionic bonds are called formula units. They do not exist by themselves. To get the formula of an ionic compound, write the charge of the ions and use the crisscross method as we showed extensively. And then lastly, I couldn't help, crystal healing is a huge, enormous load of crap. And that is the end. But since I promised an appendix, uh, that's not the end. You just might want to hit pause because I'm out of here.